Okay, so it's uh, 2 p.m., so we're going to get going here. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the third webinar of the ICDE Spring Webinar Series. Uh, I'm glad that you could join us today. In this webinar, uh, you will hear from Dr. Amardeep Kellen from Austin Community College. Uh, she is going to demo a Python programming course offered within a competency-based framework. Uh, she's also going to provide insight into the development of the course framework student engagement, adaptive release, and course assessment. So the presentation is going to be uh, roughly 45 to 50 minutes, and there should be enough time uh, for Q&A at the end. Uh, so if you have any questions along the way, please uh, log them in the question box, and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. I will be reviewing the question comments throughout the webinar. Uh, I want to thank Amardeep for being here with us today. Uh, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Amardeep so she can introduce herself and get the demo started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Amardeep Kalan. I am at Austin Community College, as Carlos said. And thank you, Carlos, and to you and to ICBE for including me in this webinar series. Um, so I have been involved with Competency Base since 2013, when I created the first course. And uh, we got the first course online. We've had a huge success with our CBE program. Uh, we started with a Department of Labor grant. We were going to um, we were going to have about 350 people go through the program. To date, we've had we've had 1,200 people. And uh, not just that, we've also increased the number of female graduates in our CBE computer science program to 51%, uh, which if you know, there is a big problem with the lack of female graduates in computer science. So um, we are incredibly proud of that. Um, and uh, I really want to welcome you to this webinar. Uh, feel free to type in your questions as you go. And you probably see um, a slide on your screen that says, I said I taught him, I didn't say he learned it. Now, this is a uh, very classic of the traditional modality of teaching. Uh, you have Johnny who comes into the class. Um, Johnny comes into class one. He sits um, through the entire class. He goes till week nine. Uh, week nine comes along, you give the midterm in the class and Johnny fails the midterm because Johnny has had best friends, parents, neighbors, you know, um, um, online tutors, forums that have been helping him do the labs. And so Johnny has appeared to understand everything. And once you get to test one in the traditional setting where you would have two tests, like a midterm and a final, um, Johnny proves that he really hasn't learned what, what he set out to learn. And it's a bit late at that mark to bring Johnny back and to start him from the beginning and help him succeed. So what do we do then? What is the, what is the response to that? What is the solution to that? Well, one of the solutions is um, uh, to test Johnny at various milestones and to have different kinds of testing. The testing that uh, we normally do in higher ed is a summative um, assessment, which is we wait until week nine, we wait until week eight, we give a test, we wait till the last week, which is week 15 or 16, we give a test. And um, now um, th there's a problem with that. So with uh, CBE, as you'll see in my course, I'm able to assess my students at various milestones and uh, then uh, take corrective action based on that assessment. Because after all, we are here for our students. We're here to help them succeed. And if they're not getting through the classes, it's a big problem. And um, this actually goes in line with uh, the whole um, um, Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board Initiative of 6030, which is 60% of Texans will have a bachelor's by 2030. Part of the reason people drop out of college is because they cannot take the pace. They feel they cannot complete it. Whereas if we provide them wraparound support and provide them assessments at multiple uh, milestones and provide multiple kinds of assessment, uh, we would drastically drop down that uh, dropout rate and also increase the completion rate. So um, having said this, 
I'm going to um, I'm going to go ahead and um, show you uh, my course, which is um, which is a CBE course, and uh, show you also the process how we got to that. So, one of the things that we um, look at when you um, when you look at um, when you look at CBE and with um, apologies to Shakespeare, here is to CBE or not to CBE. Um, the first question you have to ask yourself is, do you need it? And if you don't need it, well, then you don't need to do it because it's really not for everyone. It requires a lot of effort up front, And if it's not something that you can identify with the mission of your institution or your program, it's not something you need. But to build a CBE course after you've got past the model, the infrastructure, I'm not going to go through that because we only have 40 minutes, um, you get to the course design. And what is really critical in the course design is the instructional designer. We have a gem of an instructional designer here at um, Austin Community College. Uh, Ningua is just amazing with CBE course design. And once you design the course, then the course developer, who's generally the faculty member, uh, builds out the course. And while building out the course, tests out the course um, to see how um, well the course is actually working. Is it doing what it's supposed to do? And you test it out. You can either test it out using um, if you have TAs or you can test it out using other students or test it out using yourself, put, putting yourself in, in the shoes of the student. And after you built it, you deploy, you evaluate and assess uh, not just the course, but you also evaluate and assess how the students are doing. And you come, you can either come back to design or come back to building another course. Um, so what does a um, competency-based course look like? We run our courses in Blackboard because that is um, the course that, uh, that is the LMS that we choose. Um, everything is in competencies. Um, I, till last semester, I did adaptive release for my course, which means the course would only get released one module at a time. Uh, this semester, I'm trying something a little bit different, and I'll talk to you about that a little later. So one of the things that happens in online learning, I'm going to talk to you about the online competency-based course. Uh, one of the things that happens in online learning is that um, students need to have their expectations fully clarified. The, that's the first thing. The second thing that needs to happen is students must know that the kind of supports that are available to them um, because they must know that there is help available. Online students function differently. If I'm, if I'm teaching in a class, I can look at the student's face, I can look at the student's eyes, and I know from if I see a glazed over look or a googly eyed look, um, I know that they're not getting what I'm teaching. Um, so in the online class, it becomes different. The onus for seeking help gets um, uh, placed on the student, and it's very important to tell the student all the sources they have for, um, uh, for seeking help in that course. Um, so what I start out with is I start out with the course orientation and the rest of the course um, is not visible to them when they start out. The only thing visible to them is the orientation. Um, and my orientation uh, requires a lot of different steps. It requires a lot of different things they need to do. Um, I give an, uh, an introduction. I give the objectives of the orientation. Uh, what are the learning objectives? Remember, learning objectives are very different from learning outcomes. Um, learning outcomes are course level. Learning objectives are competency level. Um, and um, so what they are required to do in orientation is they have several things they have to read. They have to read an orientation document that looks like this. It's basically a PowerPoint in the form of a PDF. You know, are they really ready for distance learning? Um, what are the resources that can help them? Free tutoring. That's told to them up front that not only is there free tutoring, but I hold online office hours at this. So they immediately know that there are two avenues for help up front. Um, 
Then I give them the rest of the information about how they can complete their classwork. What are the minimum computer skills they need? Because this is an online class and it's a fast paced pace class, this semester I'm teaching the class in the 12 week uh, format. Um, because it's a fast paced paced class, uh, they don't, students don't have the time to get caught up in computer literacy and computer skills. So it, it's imperative um, to give them that information up front, right at the outset, that these are the minimum computer skills they should possess. Um, about adaptive release, um, general course guidelines, and, and um, um, so on. And then um, I have a document that I show them that is um, about email etiquette. Because my aim is not just to te teach programming to my students, um, but it's also um, to teach them professionalism. And the email etiquette talks about how they can communicate with me, uh, what kind of etiquette um, do I expect from them um, on email. And that goes into their professional life. So here is just a list of rules they have, you know, that um, they have to follow. So, and then um, the next thing I talk to them is about what are the different steps to success. And this is another document they have to read through. I know that's a lot of reading up front, but these are condensed. They're very easy to read, but it basically sets up the expectations for them. And I think that is so important um, in, in this kind of a course. Um, particularly this, Pace Yourself. And this is the most important, which is why it has three asterisks in front of it and three asterisks behind it. Ask early, ask often. I can't stress this enough to my students. And I also tell them, that they are not alone. And I also ask them, because this is a course at which students can be at different levels, um, they can get on the discussion board and a student will post on there and say, oh, I'm already done with project three. And suddenly um, I'll, I would get panicked emails from the students saying, oh, I'm only on project one, but there are people done with project three. Am I really behind? No, you're not because students will work at their own pace. That's the whole thing about competency-based education about CBE. Um, they have to read an FAQ, which is a very simple FAQ uh, for this course. Um, they have to read the syllabus and the course schedule. And I want to show you um, the course schedule. Uh, my course schedule is set up um, differently from um, most course schedules, most course schedules, you will see they'll have 16 rows, a date in the leftmost column, and you will have a, um, uh, you know, the readings in, in the next columns. Uh, my course schedule is set up like this. In the leftmost column, you have the name of the competency the activities for that competency module, the submission requirements for that competency module, and then the last due date. Uh, the reason it says last is because this in this course, students can accelerate. Um, I did experiment one semester with not giving any last due date, just making it a completely self-paced course. And I kid you not, everybody, everybody, turned in everything in the last week of the semester. And so I decided that that was a no-go. That was never happening again. Um, so I give them the chance to accelerate, but I don't give them the chance to fall behind unless the extenuating reasons why they are falling behind. And I consider not understanding the material to be an extenuating reason, but I do reach out to students and I do offer support to them when they are falling behind. Um, so that is the course schedule. And what does my typical competency module look like? And I want to show you that. Um, my typical competency module, let's look at one of them. Um, the competency module has an introduction. It tells you what the competency is about. It has a learning objectives or sub competencies in that competency module. And then um, there is a read it section 
a watch it section and a do it section. These three are important. All three are important. Um, in the read it section, it tells them what they're supposed to read for this competency. Um, in the watch it section, there are several videos that are given to them. And these are videos, most of them I've recorded myself. Uh, some of them are external videos. Um, and it tells them which one is the external video. Um, and in the lab example, they're given a couple of examples they can look at before they read the lab. Since this is an online class, I don't have the luxury to stand with them when I'm handing out the lab in class and explaining the lab to them. So I do the next best thing. I give them a lot of examples and then um, that when they get to the do it, which is a lab, every lab has two parts to it. Um, they also have a video explaining that lab exactly as I would do in an online class. Uh, in an in-class, sorry, in an in-class classroom uh, where I would stand and explain the lab. So what I'm doing here is I'm showing them a video about this lab project, explaining this lab project. And what does this video do? Let me just, uh, you know, show you. And and basically I, I, use, I use markups. Let me just... I go through the entire video and I show them exactly what needs to be done. I explain the lab to them and um, also I, t I tell them what to be cautious of in this lab. I tell them what are some of the traps they could fall into in this lab. Um, and I also tell them the pace at which uh, they might want to work at this lab. Um, so um, that is what I do in the videos. And I'll let you just look at the screen for a second. So as you can see from the markup, I mark up things that they need to look at, things that are important, and they can now see a complete explanation of this lab. And the other thing I have my students do is I have them do a learning log. A learning log is really important. Um, sorry about that. Um, a learning log is really important. A learning log is a, um, is a journal and they have to work on this journal. And they, it, many of them get surprised when they come in do I have a journal in a programming class? Yes, because when we look at students learning, one of the things we want them to look at is reflect on their learning. Reflect on not only what they've learned, but reflect on what they have learned and uh, how they have learned uh, what they learned. So um, what I do is I have them fill out this learning log and I'm going to show you that in a, in a second. Um, and this is what the learning log looks like. I'm sorry, my computer is kind of slow. Um, reflect on what you learned in this competency from the readings, the labs, the videos you watched. Did you have any aha moments? Did you make any real world connections? Um, because if students can see the real world connections, they will do really well on the assignments. Um, Tell me about the most in interesting slash important thing you learned in this competency. What is still fuzzy in this competency? So that's what the learning log does. It, it asks them to uh, reflect on their learning. It asks them to reflect on what they understood and what they didn't understand. And the learning log is a required part of their assignments. So now we come back to our friend, Johnny. So I, as I explained in my example that Johnny is coming to the class, Johnny is sitting through the class for nine weeks. He's taking test one and suddenly you find out that Johnny is not doing very well on test one. So um, how do I implement assessments? 
here is a module assessment and students have to complete this assessment for each module. And it's not a simple assessment. There's two parts to it because when you write a program, when you, when you go and work in, uh, when you look at programming assignments, you can test students two ways. You can test students by asking them multiple choice questions or short answer questions, or you can test them by asking them uh, to write a program. I do it both ways. I, I, I do both. I ask them multiple choice short answer questions, and I also ask them to write a program. Um, so my module two assessment, and I will um, you know, start this assessment, and let me just move that a little bit. And I will start this assessment here um, and say begin. And I will say, um, this is a loop. Um, um, what is a loop? You know, ask them a uh, fill in the blank question, ask them short answer questions, ask them, you know, some outputs, ask them to write a little bit of code. So it's a mix of all different kinds of questions. It's not just auto graded multiple choice questions. So I actually get to test them on multiple different things. And then, um, for the hands-on portion of it, I actually ask them to write a program. Write a complete and correct Python program that does the following. And they have to then submit the file. So they get multiple chances to do this. It's not just a one-time deal because that's not what CBE is about. CBE is not about testing students, giving them that one sink or swim time when um, they can take the assessment and if they sink, they sink. Because part of the reason I need them to do well is every competency builds on the previous competency. And if they haven't done well in this competency, they will not do well in the next competency. No, so I need them to do well in the assessment. I need them to do well um, in um, the lab and I need them to do well. I, I need them to tell me in the learning log what they're not understanding so that I can, I can address it. So not only do they have um, the assessment, uh, which is uh, the module assessment, they also have course exams, course assessments. So as you know, uh, when accreditors come a calling, uh, they're looking for how are you testing the students. The module assessments are done, you know, on their own time. Uh, we have course exams that are done um, on campus. They have to come to campus to do that. So um, um, they are watched when they're doing the course exam and um, they get only one chance for the course exam because they're taught everything. They're given several chances to get there. Um, they're given several chances to master the materials before they get to the course exam. And the course exam measures one competency at a time. Uh, so they are given those course exams and they have to come into campus to do those. Right. Um, so this is what my competency looks like. And every competency looks the same. You have the introduction, you have the learning objective, the read it, the watch it, the lab example, the do it, and the assessments. And um, in the lab, there are two kinds of labs. There's a one lab that builds on previous labs, which is again, why it's very important for them to master the materials because unless they can complete the previous lab, they cannot move forward in the course. Um, and they have a second lab where they write something new. And in the first lab, when they do that, starting out in competency module one, um, when they do this lab, they're told that this is a lab project um, you will be doing throughout the semester. They're told that. And again, keeping in line with um, encouraging critical thinking, with making real world connections, um, this is how my labs are written. 
in uh, my CBE course. Um, in every lab, they're told what are the cross-disciplinary connections of this lab. No, how much is this lab worth in their life at this point? And also, um, the labs are written as lengthy documents, which they have to read through and also make sense of it. Um, they're given the tasks. Every lab has with it notes about this assignment that they have to read through, which are helpful notes that help them solve that problem. And they can read through those notes. Um, they can get all the help they want through those notes and they can get to the tutors. Uh, our tutors, one of our tutors does um, online tutoring using Adobe Connect. And so students don't have to come to campus for tutoring. They can get tutoring from me through Adobe Connect so they don't have to come to campus to see me. Um, there's several, several um, ways for them to get help. Another way for them to get help is a discussion forum that I've set up on Blackboard. And that discussion forum um, uh, is, um, um, is where they can post questions. I, I'm not going to show you that forum uh, for privacy reasons because there are students who have posted questions there. Um, and um, very often when a student posts a question on a discussion forum, I find that another student will jump in who's moving ahead in the class, who's faster paced in the class, will jump in and answer that question. So that does two things. Um, that allows the students who are moving faster to feel a sense of belonging in the class. And it also does another thing. It, um, it also uh, reinforces to the students that there is help available from their peers should they need that help from their peers. So um, um, that, is, um, th that is another way for them to get help. So these are um, the salient features of the assignments. I want to get back to the assessments and I want to just tell you that the assessments in my course are very aligned to the assignments that they do. They are very aligned to the learning objectives. They test all the learning objectives of the course. For example, write a simple program using pseudocode, flowcharts, and then write code. Uh, my module assessments and my test one are going to test them on both. They're going to be asked to write pseudocode. They're going to be asked about flowcharts, and they're going to be asked to write code from the pseudocode. So the assessment, the assessments that I have in my class are not coming from publishers um, because I need my assessments to align with my course materials. Uh, it's, and, and that is critical. In a competency-based program, that is critical. You want to test mastery. Your assessments must align with every single one of your objectives. They must align with the course outcomes. And... Um, they must align with the assignments that you give in the class. Because if your assessments are coming from the publisher, you don't know if those alignments exist or not, curriculum alignments exist or not. So you want to make sure those alignments are there. Um, so um, I do make sure that's why I write my own assessments for the class. And I'm not suggesting that everybody who's listening go out and write their own assessments. You can get in publisher assessments and you can tweak them, you can change them, or you can pick out the questions that actually align with all the content uh, material of your class. So um, that is my competency-based uh, programming in Python class. And um, I would like to um, take uh, a few minutes here to take any questions that you might have. Carlos, do you want to facilitate that? And then maybe I can show a little bit more based on those questions. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Amardeep. Um, so we'll open it up to questions. Um, uh, if you can log in your any questions you might have about the demo uh, on the question box, we'll be happy to answer them for you.
Okay, uh, Amardeep, I have uh, the first question for you. What is your insight on building cohorts community in CBE? Um, you can uh, build cohorts in CBE. There, there are several. Um, there are several schools that are doing that, and one of the schools that comes to mind is um, uh, is Salt Lake um, Community College. They are actually doing it in a brick and mortar. Uh, situation, but you can build cohorts, but your cohorts become um, uh, you, what you're doing is you're doing what we are doing is doing CBE course based. We're not doing the uh, the subscription model. We're not doing the competency bucket model or direct assessment. We're doing course based. In course based, it's it's easier to build cohorts because you bring students into the same course. They do function at a different level, but then you do have students that function together as well. And what you do is within the cohort, you build sub cohorts. You build sub teams of students that work together. And some of the students will finish the course earlier. And that makes it a bit of a challenge and how do you get the students to finish at the same time. But if you're looking at them to finish at the same time, you're really not taking advantage of the CBE model. So what you need to do is take your students and build sub cohorts or sub teams of students within that based on their level and based on what, what speed they're progressing at. I hope that answers your question. Do you need me to say something, uh, something you, else about uh, it? Let me know. Here's a good question from Ariel. Uh, do all students need to read, watch all provided materials, or can they skip resources with which they are already familiar with? They can skip resources, but they can skip the assignments and the assessments. I haven't done that yet. That's something I need to experiment with in the future. They cannot skip the assignments and the assessments. Um, I've found that I've I've had students, and and that's based on my experience. So I've been in higher ed for what 29 years now, um, but that's based on my experience. I've found students who come in with programming experience. Um, they. Um, also uh, need that formalization of the specs. Uh, they need that formalization of the lab and they need to prove through the assessments that they actually understand the material taught in my course, not what they've learned outside my course. Um, and I know that goes against, um, you know, the competency-based learning and the PLA, but right now that's the way my course is set up. I do know people at other institutions who will set up their course where they will do a pre-assessment. Yeah. And if and they I was can do a, that. right. So if they can do a pre-assessment yeah. of the module and they can get like a 85 or 95 percent or above, or some some institutions do 100 percent, if they can get 100 percent on the pre-assessment, then they can skip that module altogether. Yeah, Ariel, and that's how our, so our model is a pre-test, post-test model. Um, you know, they, they need to get an 80% on that final assessment to complete the course. Uh, so let's, let's say they score high on that pre-test, uh, uh, then they can skip over the material they already know, focus on what they need to, uh, to get that 80% on that post-test assessment. Any more questions for MRD, guys? Uh, this is uh, your time. So, any more questions for Amardeep? Any other uh, questions, uh, Carlos? You, I, uh, if you can, if you can give an example on a cohort community. Um, you know, we haven't done cohorts in our. Uh, program, but I like I gave you the example of Salt Lake Community College. They're doing cohorts, and um, uh, Carlos, yeah. you're doing cohorts. Are you doing cohort we, model? We, so, we, so we do not. That's a good question from uh, from Dean Wu. Um, so I think when they were building the program, they you know they juggled the idea of cohort um, cohorts, but we did not end up doing that. So uh, you know, just like you are are program is flexible, students are going at, at a flexible pace um, as they learn or or, or, comp or uh, make competency of the material. So we do not do cohorts. Yeah, so that becomes a little bit of a challenge, um, you know, doing cohorts 
And um, but what it I said is, is that you can you can build subgroups within the groups. And uh, does um, does Brandman do a cohort model, Carlos? I I'm thinking I they am, do. I am not sure. I am not yeah, sure. I'm, I'm thinking they do, but maybe not. So, um, but that becomes a challenge, yes. So but there are, uh, but there oh. are, there are tech program platforms out there that do allow you to uh, build cohorts. So, um, because with cohorts, you can do different kinds of cohorts. You can um, do structural cohorts. You know, like um, groups that all your courses will be with the same students. You know, so you take programming one, two, three, four, and you take them with the same students. Um, you can, um, or you can build um, informal or functional cohorts. Um, so, and in all cases here, uh, because we're doing self-paced, because we are saying you can accelerate, you do have to stick with a sub-cohort model rather than, um, you know, uh, no, um, rather than a full cohort model. So, for example, we have a 16 week semester, we have a 12 week and an eight week. So, really, um, let's give Johnny a break here. So, Johnny could come into the 16 week semester, finish that in three weeks, and could enroll for the next class in the 12 week semester. Finish that in three weeks and could enroll for the next one in the eight week semester. So suddenly, you know, if you, if we're looking at a structural cohort, which is taking the same students to the same classes, that cohort gets broken right there. Yeah. You know, because Johnny's uh, moved on to the next class. Yeah. So and and again, I think you know that that's basically the purpose of, of CD. So. For example, D, I'll give you an example of the flexibility CBE can afford, right? Uh, we had uh, Scott, um, who was a statistician in the Army. He was able to complete statistics, intro to statistics, in uh, three or four days, but then he spent the full seven weeks on art appreciation. So that, that's the idea behind it, that uh, students can leverage that knowledge that they already bring uh, to the table and, and, and advance uh, in their test work. Um, Amrit Ariel asks, are you the only available tutor or do you use another tutoring resource? No, we have in-house tutors. We don't use an external tutoring resource. Uh, we have in-house tutors. We have our own students uh, who have already done the course. Um, we have, so, so let me tell you a little bit about Austin Community College. We have 11 campuses. Our service area is the size of the state of New Jersey. It's that big. And uh, so on each of these campuses, we have computer science labs. On, on, on a majority of the campuses, we have computer science labs. And our tutors sit in these labs. They are our students who have formally taken the course. They've done well in the course. They've been recommended by their fact instructors. They are interviewed. They are hired as hourly workers. And they spend time. So we have in-house tutoring. We don't have third-party tutoring, which I'm, I'm glad we don't. And I'm glad we have in-house tutorings because we can, um, instructors can share resources with the tutors. Um, you know, I can walk downstairs to the lab and I can go say hi to my tutor and talk face-to-face -face with the tutor and see if there's a particular student. And the tutor will tell me if there's a particular student who's having extra trouble understanding something and I can reach out to that student on my own. Um, so, so we like our in-house tutors. Yeah, I, I am, Ariel, I hope that was your question. If, uh, how do you balance ratio of subjective assessment versus hands-on assessments in CBE and face-to-face -face assessments versus fully online assessments? Um, so in my um, exam, um, the test one, um, the, the exam where they have to come to, in, in the module assessment, it is, um, in the module assessment, it is 50-50. 50% comes from the hands-on and 50% comes from the concept assessment. In the test where they come to campus, 40% comes from hands-on and 60% comes from the concept. 
Um, and as far as um, how much weightage is given to them, I'll show you that in a second. Um, in my course syllabus, um, here is the weightage that's given to them. The module assessments are 20% of the total course. Again, we are in a course-based, so the total course and the course exam is 35%. The reason I have the exam higher is because that is in a very closely watched environment. So how do I uh, prevent my students who are doing the module assessment in a not closely watched environment? How do I prevent them from seeking help in that? Well, firstly, I tell them that your course exam is going to look exactly like your module assessment. So if you had your neighbor, your friend, you know, um, whoever help you with the module assessment, you will not be able to take the course exam. And the minute you take, and I tell them that in the orientation. So during orientation, they're required to do one hour of Adobe Connect, what I call the, my uh, video to video orientation. They're required to do that with me. And I tell them that in that. And, and I have never ha had, I've had maybe, a handful of students in the past few years who have consistently done well on the labs and the module assessment and bombed the course exam. You know, I've had pretty much, pretty much similar results in the module assessments and the course exam for most students, you know, for, for a large majority of the students. Um, so the course exam is, is, has a higher uh, percentage with that. And also, this is also to lend legitimacy to the grade, particularly if someone is going to come and look at your class and, and question and say, you know what, the module assessments are done on their own. How do you know someone is not doing it for them? But the course exam is proctored. So the largest amount of grade comes from the course exam, which is also two parts to it, the hands-on part and the concepts part. Of that 35%, 40% is coming from the hands-on where they actually have to write a program. Sitting in the lab, they get one chance and they get five hours to do it. You know, Perfect. and I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um... So do students ever ask for any exceptions for coming to campus? No, I haven't had because that is a requirement. And what I do is, um, like for example, this semester, course exam one is due on April 1st. And uh, the labs will have the exam by day after tomorrow, which is Friday, which is going to be March the 9th. So they have from March 9th through April 1st, which is a time period of 22 days to come in and take that test. You know, um, course exam two is due April 20th, but the labs will have it on March 9th. So they have 42 days to take that test. You know, so there is no reason, it's not like they get a three day time window where things could go wrong and they aren't able to make it to the lab. So they get a really big time window. I have not had anybody ask for an exception. Perfect. Oh, wait, I, I we have at AC, I just want to clarify this to you. We do have at ACC in distance learning, they have the ability to test remotely. I have had students do that. I've had one student who was in the military. He was in the Middle East, took the course from there. I've had another student in Colombia who was in a U.S. military base in Colombia. I've had one student working with SAP who took the course exams in Germany. So what they do that is what they have, another student who took the course exam in Los Angeles because her grandmother was sick, she had to go there. So the onus falls on the student at that point to go and set up with a local college or a local 
um, like for example, on the military base, it was a supervisor of the soldier who was supervising, and and uh, it to set up with them and to and to tie up with our distance learning, and say this is where I'm going to be taking the exam. I need my exam sent to this place, and so distance learning takes care of that. I have had that happen, but I haven't had a student living within our service area who said that I cannot come and take the exam. So could I have an exception? Okay, they say thank you, very helpful. Um, so let me uh, change the screen here. Um, okay, um, okay, so thank you, Amardeep, uh, for that, uh, for all that wonderful information, all that knowledge. Um, uh, once we send out uh, the webinar, they will have your contact information just in case anyone has any follow-up sure. questions. Sure, um, feel free to email. Did, yeah, I did want to tell uh, all the audience that we do have another webinar coming up. Uh, Jennifer Nalos from the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board uh, will be talking about expanding a statewide initiative, uh, the Texas Affordable Baccalaureate Program. And for those Texas institutions that are joining us, um, she will probably discuss some funding that is available if you're interested in developing uh, your own TAP program at your institutions. Uh, so I hope uh, you can join us. Again, uh, thank you, Amardeep, uh, for the wonderful information. And I will uh, give everyone your contact if they want to follow up with you. Thanks. Thanks, and Carlos. Thank and yeah, go ahead. No, I was saying, and feel free to email this is to anyone listening, feel free to email. Excellent. And thank you to all our uh, attendees, and I hope to see you on the next webinar. You'll have thank, a good you. Day. thank you. Bye. Thank you, Amardeep. Bye.